an essay. By the way, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I've been at ECSU for 22 years, and uh, since, since since the 90s, I guess my 22nd, I started basically in 1999, so it's my 22nd year, I guess you could say, starting here. Um, I'm happy to be back. I wish I were in front of you speaking, and I think um, it's always easier that way. I've never presented on the phone like this um, in my office, but this will let you know my office is located right on the third floor of Gilchrist, so I know that I'm just a few few floors above you. Um, but, and again, ECSU has a very proud history and we are now into our 120, sort of be 129 years. Uh, so that's a long time and 30 minutes is not a long time to, to cover such a very long and proud history. Um, but I'm gonna just get started here. Uh, I hope you're excited about this year. And again, I'm excited about this year. Uh, this is very unusual. I've not, never taught here during a pandemic, but I'm excited that we have opportunities here and I hope you take advantage of them. And I hope you have questions, you ask Ms. Combs and ask your other instructors. But in any case, it all starts. It all starts with a man named Hugh Kale. And I'm certain maybe some of you have seen the Hugh Kale building, the Hugh Kale uh, residence hall that's now being torn down. Um, and if you look around Elizabeth City, you will, might see the Hugh Kale name. Uh, there's a building right near CVS uh, on Rose Street that's named after Hugh Kale. Who is Hugh Kale? Why is he so important? Hugh Kale was an African-American legislator in the North Carolina General Assembly. Uh, Hugh Kale was uh, born around Perquimans and after the Civil War he moved to Elizabeth City and he became very successful. Uh, he owned a number of businesses, he owned real estate, uh, and he serves a total of five separate terms in the North Carolina General Assembly. Hugh Kill was somebody committed to education. He was supported education for African Americans. He supported education for white Americans. He supported education, period. Uh, and throughout his many years in the North Carolina General Assembly, he had always tried to get a state-supported normal school for Elizabeth City. Now, a normal school is not what we think today as a modern university. A normal school was not a university at all. Frankly, what it did is it provided teacher training and teacher training alone. Uh, if, we, if we define a normal school the way we define education today, a normal school would only be teaching grades five through eight. Uh, and the, the, the students would be generally 15 years and higher. Uh, and the goal was to give them training so they could teach the primary schools, i.e. what we call today grades one through four. Okay. There weren't any high schools, public high schools at the time in Elizabeth City uh, when, in 1891. So the whole idea of having high school and then going to college, that was a pipe dream for most people. Uh, the wealthy did go to, let's say, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, let's see, Joey, but other than that, and only whites who were wealthy, um, but Hugh Kill nevertheless wanted to have a normal school, and he was able to succeed in doing that, and the school opened up on January 4, 1891. Now, Hugh Kill was not an educator himself, um, so who was hired then to run this new school? Uh, that opened in January 1891, sorry, 1892, sorry. Um, the man who was hired as one who would be directing this school was a man, man named Peter Weddick Moore. Peter Weddick Moore. Uh, Moore actually was born into slavery. He was born in North Carolina, uh, and he was born in the late 1850s. And well, what we know about Peter W. Moore is that his father may have been killed after the Civil War by members of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so he had a, a, a hard time growing up, as did African Americans in the United States after the Civil War. Uh, but Peter B. Moore went to Shaw University, and he took him several years to finish. Uh, and when he did, he first was an assistant at what was called Plymouth State Normal School. This no longer exists. Uh, and then he was hired as the principal. Now, when Elizabeth City State, and it was called the Elizabeth City State Color Normal School opened in 1892,
There was only two instructors, he and a man named John Henry Manning Butler. Uh, you might have seen Butler Hall on campus. Butler Hall is right near the library that's being fixed up right now. Uh, Butler Hall was named after John Henry Manning Butler. Uh, so this was simply enough, two instructors, 23 students when it opened up. And it didn't even open up. It didn't open up on this campus. Uh, where we are right now was land and it was farmland and there was no school. Uh, the location of the school was actually what we call now kind of downtown. Uh, the first year it was on what we call today Roanoke Avenue. If you drive past campus on Harrington Road and head towards downtown, you will see Roanoke Avenue. That's where the school began. The school was in rented facilities. It took many years, it took 20 years for us to finally get a proper home. Um, and that story, how we got a proper home is, is very interesting. And uh, said, I wrote an essay that's um, gonna be in your freshman seminar book. Uh, and, and you will see a little bit about that. Uh, but T.W. Moore was somebody who was perfect for Elizabeth City State Normal School. Uh, he had a very good temperament. He was a committed academic. He was a committed educator. Uh, and he took education very seriously. To him, it was part of his uh, religion. It was part of his faith as a Roanoke Missionary Baptist to uplift the community. Uh, and the school needed a visionary leader like P.W. Moore. Uh, and if you looked on campus, you might notice that there was some work being done on a building right by Southern Avenue. That's P.W. Moore Hall. Uh, P.W. Moore Hall has been in existence for almost 100 years. And now that hall is being renovated. And hopefully in the next couple of years, that will be completed. Uh, but P.W. Moore was said fought to keep this institution alive. Because the reality was many, the, the, when, when um, around 1900, there were seven schools, seven state normal schools for African-Americans in North Carolina. And now today, only three exist. Several were closed down, um, but ECSU is now one of only three that remain. Uh, the other two, one was in Fayetteville, which we call now Fayetteville State University, and the other was in Winston-Salem, which we call Winston-Salem State University. So in many ways, ECSU and Fayetteville State and Winston-Salem State are kind of um, schools that are related and that we all survived in the early 1900s when life was very hard in North Carolina and in the South for African Americans. Um, P.W. Moore served for 37 years as principal and back then that was what the title was called. Um, but in 1928, after 37 years of leadership, he retired and in his place was a man named John Henry Bias. John Henry Bias I uh, actually had been a teacher at Elizabeth City State Normal School in the early 1900s. Now, Bias, in many ways, was another perfect leader at a time that was very difficult for North Carolina. Uh, John Henry Bias was a follower of a man named Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington believed that if African Americans wanted to survive and thrive, they needed to become financially independent. They needed to improve themselves. They needed to educate themselves. They needed to be good citizens. John Henry Bias took that very seriously. In fact, this is a very well known, uh, but John Henry Bias and two fellow uh, African-Americans in Elizabeth City bought 80 acres of Outer Banks real estate in what is now called Duck, North Carolina. North Carolina. I'm certain some of you have already been to the beach. Uh, and if you head to the beach, you might see a small community called Duck. He and his investors bought 80 acres. Uh, that land, if, if, they, if they owned it all today, that land would be worth many, many millions. Uh, in fact, the families, the Bias family still owns some property out there at the beach. Uh, so that takes financial genius to buy 80 acres of land for about $2,800 in 1929. Uh, the university back then, it was still called the State Normal School, needed a financial genius like John Henry Bias 
during what became the worst financial calamity in modern US history, and that would be the Great Depression in the late 1920s, early 1930s. John Henry Bias applied his financial genius during a time when people had a hard time finding food to survive. Uh, during the Great Depression, faculty members suffered a 50% pay cut because the state didn't have money for, for anything uh, for them. Uh, now, what he did to keep the school sur surviving was he had an idea. He knew that most families who had students were farmers and had an, uh, maybe either own land or they rented as sharecroppers and tenant farmers. And he thought, since the, the students don't have cash, let them pay for their fees and tuition in terms of produce. They, in other words, they barter their way. And so what happened is students would pay for their tuition and produce like potatoes and peas. And that provided the food for the students. And, and that helped the university to help the, the school survive. If not for the genius of um, John Henry Bias, this school might not have survived, okay? But we weren't a university. We weren't even a college. We didn't even have, okay, we were still teacher training. It was late during John Henry Bias's time as president. And he actually became the first formal president of State Normal School. It was in 1937 that the state finally allowed Elizabeth City State Normal School to grant bachelor's degrees. And that was only in one program, elementary education. Uh, in May 1939, uh, John Henry Bias was very sick and was in the hospital up in Baltimore in John Hopkins University Hospital. Uh, that was when students were finally going to get their first college degrees. And he came back and in May 1939, in what is now Moore Hall, the first 26 graduates received their Bachelor's of Science in elementary education. Uh, that meant that we were finally going to be a collegiate institution. We were finally going to be a college. And that's why we became, because of that, Elizabeth City State Teachers College. Uh, and very shortly after that graduation, he passed away. That's the way of so fairly young man. Uh, which was a shock because John Henry Bias was very popular in the community. The question was now, who was going to succeed him? Because now this was a college. Uh, the man who was going to succeed him was a man named Harold Leonard Trigg. And Trigg uh, was important because he kept the, the now State Teachers College alive during the Great Depression. I'm sorry, during, during World War II. Uh, World War II was a tough time because the college was losing faculty and staff members and students to the war because people were needed, men were needed to fight the war overseas in Europe and in Asia. And so that meant that the campus, the, most of the student body was actually made up of women. There were very few male students on campus because those students who were on campus were literate and literacy was prized as the military recruit. And so, this college lost many of its students to military service. Now, fortunately, almost all of them came home alive. Uh, only one student died during the war, a man named Ulysses Robbins. Uh, but it meant that this campus was very different. And the question was, would Trigg be able to keep this college afloat because of all the students who were now going overseas? And the question was, yes, yes, he was. Uh, and believe it or not, the college actually increased its enrollment during the Second World War, uh, and the, which itself is pretty remarkable. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, the building that's next to P.W. Moore is named after Harold Leonard Trigg. And if you look across the street, you have the Trigg School. Uh, Trigg was important in North Carolina history, not just here in Elizabeth City, but Carolina history, period, because Trigg was the first African-American to be appointed to the State Board of Education in North Carolina. And that was in 1949. Um, so that was a major, major um, significant fact because before then, the State Board of Education was made up of only whites. And now that Trigg was on the board, now you would have a more representative body governing essentially education in the state of North Carolina. 
And so that's why Trigg is historically very important. In 1945, Trigg resigned to accept a position at an interracial organization down in Atlanta. And so the question became, uh, who was going to take over? And that man was going to be Sidney David Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams was uh, formerly a member of the uh, academic uh, administration. He was formerly what we call today the provost. Uh, Dr. Williams knew that after the Second World War, education was going to change. You know, the GI Bill was going to revolutionize higher education. And he wanted to position Elizabeth City State Teachers College so it would be more than just a teacher's college teaching only one degree program, elementary education. Um, and that would be a major struggle because he wanted to increase the diversity of academic programs. He wanted us to offer more than just elementary education, but the state wouldn't let him do that. But some things were able to be done. For example, uh, the birth of kind of the modern day athletics program took place under Dr. Williams. Uh, under Robert Louis Vaughn, um, the university started to become very active and started to be um, ultimately rejoined the CAAA in 1957. Uh, and if you look on campus, you notice that the gymnasium, uh, where we will hopefully play basketball uh, in a few months, named after um, Coach Vaughn. Uh, Coach Vaughn was coach for many years, uh, for over three, over three decades. And he retired with over 500 wins. Uh, in basketball. Not many coaches make it to 500 wins. Uh, also during Dr. Williams' time, the Student Government Association was established. It was established because students wanted to have more freedom. And after the Second World War, students started to demand more authority. They wanted to be, have more of their own self-leadership. Uh, Dr. Williams came from a generation in which students didn't have that kind of power. And so students actually on this campus in 1953 led a strike. Uh, the students decided that they wanted to make some changes uh, and they refused to come to class. And then the college said, okay, we're gonna shut down the cafeteria. So for several days, uh, there was kind of like a, a little, kind of a mini war between the students and the, and the staff. Ultimately it was resolved and the Student Government Association was formed. And ever since then, uh, students have had, an, have had a role on campus authority. And I don't know if you know this, but the Student Government Association president is actually a member of the Board of Trustees at ECSU. Uh, so that was a major accomplishment in terms of having students being in charge. Uh, Dr. Williams retired in 1958, and in his place was the, I would say, one of the great executives uh, and and one, of the, one of the great civil rights leaders in North Carolina, a man named Walter Nathaniel Ridley. Dr. Ridley is important because he, in 1953, graduated from the University of Virginia with a doctorate in education. Why is that so important? Dr. Ridley, because of that, became the first African American to graduate with an academic doctorate from a state university that was once part of the Confederacy. You see, um, state universities would now would not admit African Americans to the student body. And, and that continued on until the 1950s. Uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill did not admit uh, students who were African American until the early 1950s. Uh, Ridley was the first in the country. Um, and Ridley knew that this institution needed to diversify its academic program. So it was during his time that the State Teachers College became Elizabeth City State College. And that meant that some of the degree programs that we have today were born under his time. As, he, as, the, as the institution started to add new degree programs, the name was changed in 1963 to Elizabeth City State College. Uh, during Dr. Willie's time, the college enrollment just grew rapidly. Uh, I mean, it was bursting at the seams. Uh, you see, Dr. Williams wanted to diversify the fact of diversify the academic offerings, but the state wouldn't let him. The state allowed it under Dr. Ridley. Uh, now, an also important aspect during this time was that student activism took off on this campus, both in 1960 and in 1963. Elizabeth City State students went downtown 
and demanded that, uh, simply enough, restaurants be allowed to serve African Americans. And you might say, really? Students couldn't at one point go down and eat like everybody else? Absolutely. That's how it was. That was, in many ways, the law. It was also part of tradition and customs. And students went downtown. And in 1960, they went to uh, a department store called W.T. Grant, which was located on Main Street by the courthouses, and demanded that they be served at the lunch counter. Uh, and ultimately, they succeeded. In 1963, they went downtown and demanded to be served at other restaurants. In 1963, uh, over 200 of them were arrested. And some of them actually were, were uh, forced to go to court. Some of them were found guilty in court, and they had their sentences ultimately overturned by the North Carolina Supreme Court. But the fact is that students were willing to make a difference, and they were arrested in order to diversify, to desegregate facilities. Uh, and now today, students can go anywhere. You can go to parks, you can go to restaurants, you can go to where you want. Um, and it's because of the work and the sacrifice that students made on this campus in the early 1960s. Uh, Dr. Ridley uh, served for over 10 years. And after his time, he retired and moved to become a professor in Pennsylvania. And in his place was a man named Marion Dennis Thorpe. Now, Dr. Thorpe is important because um, Dr. Thorpe wanted to further diversify the academic offerings. Dr. Thorpe believed as society was changing, African Americans were now going to be able to be open to have jobs that were previously shut off to them. Now, under Dr. Ridley, academic offerings were diversified. But it was under Dr. Thorpe that you really see us becoming not just a college, but a true university, a true university. In 1969, Elizabeth City State College was renamed, and that's what we are today, the Elizabeth City State University. And in 1973, we became formally a constituent institution in the University of North Carolina system. Uh, Dr. Thorpe was well-respected in the state and well-respected in this country. Uh, he was somebody whom presidents would actually talk to. Uh, he actually was invited and actually met President Richard Nixon one-on-one -on -one in the White House. Now, that's, that's pretty powerful when you can actually speak to the president. Uh, and actually, President Nixon was able to give Dr. Thorpe some special funds to help Elizabeth City State University. Uh, it was under Dr. Thorpe that many of our great popular degree programs were established. Degree programs like police science technology. I say, what's that? Well, actually, that's what we call now criminal justice. Criminal justice was established under Dr. Thorpe. Psychology was established under Dr. Thorpe. Uh, social work was ultimately established. Social work was actually created as a concentration in the sociology program. And now today, it's one of our most thriving degree programs. Uh, so, so Dr. Thorpe was one who, who said transitioned the institution to, to be really truly a university. It was also during Dr. Thorpe's time that uh, the ECSU men's basketball team won its first Seattle Boy championship. And one of the stars from that was a man named Mike Gale. Uh, Mike Yale was in the news um, a couple weeks ago. He passed away. Uh, Mike Yale played for many years uh, in the NBA. He was a member of um, the San Antonio Spurs. He was a point guard. Uh, and I remember looking online, there was, a, there was a, a video that somebody comes up with every week about the most notable deaths during that week. And Mike Gale was on that. Uh, he passed away at the age of 70. Um, so it was during that time that we won our first of three Seattle Boy Championships. It was also during that time that uh, the campus became more desegregated. That meant that white students were now, and here's the deal, white students were never banned from being on campus. Segregation was a white thing. It was a white thing, in other words, those who were in power in the state were white in the past, and they used segregation to keep 
African Americans and others who weren't white out of positions of power and out of institutions such as University of North Carolina and Chapel Hill. Uh, but it was during this time that ECSU started to attract more white students. It started to diversify its pathway. Uh, and, and that meant that ECSU was going to be more able to serve North Carolina, not just a part of North Carolina, but North Carolina as a whole. Uh, and if you look around today, that's, that's true to this day. Um, ECSU is one of the most diverse campuses you will find in the state of North Carolina, period. We are more diverse than schools like UNC Chapel Hill and UNC Charlotte and stuff. We are more diversified on the faculty. And that's something to be very proud of. And that really took off under Dr. Thorpe. Um, after Dr. Thorpe, we had Jimmy Jenkins. Jimmy Jenkins was actually the first alum ever to become chancellor. Uh, he was the student's chancellor and that he, he was a former student himself. Uh, he was actually, um, came from a, and was raised in a single parent family. Uh, he was raised by his mom by herself. And despite having those challenges, it's a tough being a single parent. It's tough being a single parent today. Uh, but he was able to succeed and ultimately earn a PhD in biology and then become chancellor of ECSU. Uh, it was during his time that you had the birth of a new concentration called Airway Science. It was actually a mathematics computer science concentration. It wasn't a degree program yet, but it was born during Jimmy Jenkins' time. In 1986, the university established WRVS, Wonderful Radio Viking Style, 89.9. Still around. Um, new buildings were created, including the Jenkins Science Complex and such. Uh, Jenkins was important that he is, he appointed the first woman to become uh, the head academic officer. That was the vice chancellor for academic affairs, a woman named Helen Marshall Caldwell. Uh, and so that was an important step because now women were going to be involved more in university governance. Uh, Jimmy Jenkins uh, served for over 10 years. And uh, Jimmy Jenkins still to this day is a university president. He's actually president uh, of, um, of Livingston College out in Salisbury. So he's been, a, he's been a leader, an executive, a chief executive officer for 30, over 35 years. Uh, after Jenkins moved on, uh, Mickey Burnham became chancellor. And Mickey Burnham is important historically because it was during his time that the university was finally able to offer its own graduate programs. And that was a huge, huge step because it now meant that students wouldn't have to go elsewhere to finish and add some additional training. And we established graduate programs in education. And ultimately we established other programs in biology and in mathematics. Uh, and it was during this time that aviation science became uh, a separate degree program uh, and ultimately we had new programs like graphic design uh, and such and that's when this time the social work became a separate degree program and became a thriving degree program said so it was usually originally a part of sociology and now it became its own thing um, it was during this time that the university received um, significant funding uh, that meant that ECSU had had for many years not gotten the funding that it probably had deserved and had earned and needed and it was during this time that we did get more funding and many of the buildings you see um, were, still, were built during that time including the building right outside of this one the fine arts complex which is named after Mickey, Mickey Lynn Burnham. Um, in time after serving for 10 years which is a long time to serve as a, uh, an executive he became uh, president of Bowie State University in Maryland and after he moved on to Bowie State, uh, he's second along to become chancellor took over, and that was Willie J. Gilchrist. Uh, Willie J. Gilchrist is important in that you really saw, and again, aviation science had been around, but it was during this time that you really saw aviation science become a signature degree program. Now, what do I mean by a signature degree program? It means that ECSU used aviation science to attract students who otherwise might not come to the city. And that's important because what it does, it provides more students, it provides an identity. 
Because and to this day, we are the only state university in North Carolina to offer aviation science. So in other words, if you want to study aviation science, and I know many of you hearing this are here for that reason, you can't go to UNC Charlotte. You can't go to East Carolina. You have to come to ECSU. You have, in other words, we became a destination. And the, the news is that we are actually adding additional degree programs that are also going to become signature programs. Uh, but, but Gilchrist is important in that aviation science became the program that we became kind of associated with. Uh, not to diminish the impact of other degree programs, but aviation is, as you can see here, a major focus. Uh, I remember when we first got the first planes, I remember we got Air Viking 1. Now we have a fleet of planes. Uh, it was also during Chancellor Gilchrist's time that we became ranked by Washington Monthly as the number one baccalaureate institution. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that we are number one in the country in terms of, I mean, we're not, we're not Ivy League, okay? But what it means is that in terms of what we do, because universities don't just provide academics, they provide service. Uh, universities hope to find students who are coming from challenging backgrounds, uh, who, who, and then take them to a whole new level. ECSU is unique in that students might come here from uh, kind of a, a lower social economic background, in other words, not from wealth, and graduate here and then end up making significantly more money than their parents did. Uh, and that, and that is important. That is important because those kind of jobs provide health care and provide other kinds of things that, that families need. Um, ECSU is, is special in that way. We're special for our community service. We're special for a high graduation rate. Many universities would be very happy to have our student athlete graduation rate because students come to ECSU not to become future professional athletes as much, but to become university graduates, and that's something that we're proud of. And that started under Coach Vaughn, and it continues to this day. Uh, and now, ever since Chancellor Gilchrist retired, uh, this, and again, I don't have time to go over all the different chancellors, um, but I, I will say that there are some things of, of, a point, of, of points of pride. Um, when Stacey Franklin Jones became chancellor, she became the first, she became the first woman to become uh, chancellor. Uh, and that's something to be very proud of. It was during the last several years that we now have, have we have certain degree programs that are done completely online. Uh, I know that uh, interdisciplinary studies is a degree program that's completely online. We have Homeland Security, another completely online degree program. Uh, the reality is that the last several years have been a challenging time for higher education, not just at Elizabeth City, but nationwide. Uh, the fact is, is that fewer students are attending universities than they were five, ten years ago. So that means that enrollment challenges have, have been a challenge for many universities. Uh, I don't know if you know the news, but uh, several universities have already closed because of the COVID crisis. But the reality is now under our current chancellor, our enrollment is doing great. And we're, we're serving more people. And that's a great point of pride. Uh, in other words, Despite these challenges, ECSU is bucking the trend. And, and uh, now that you're here, we're proud that you're here, glad that you're here. And again, I wish I were in front of you speaking to you personally one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but we're gonna get through this COVID crisis. We're gonna make it. We're gonna emerge from this crisis better than we were before. Uh, we're gonna make this opportunity a chance to, to come through this stronger. So I hope you enjoyed this. Again, it's not ideal, and hopefully I can get to see some of you and meet some of you one-on-one. -on -one. My office is in Gilchrist. I'm open 352, and I am here in my office. I'm, I'm not always at home. I'm here on campus. Please come by, uh, say hi, and hope to see some of you around, and have a great Viking day. Bye. Bye. Welcome.